So welcome everyone to yoga. Um, I'm a little further out in the countryside at the moment, just for this Tuesday today. And um, so the internet may be a little more jittery than usual. Um, we, we also film the classes live and we upload the non-internet version of the class. So I hope it's not too frustrating, but if you need to go back to the uploaded class, you're able to. Um, we've been looking at uh, varying degrees of hip extension and flexion in relation to the standing poses. So, uh, and then either before or at the end of the class, we did a little bit to soften the upper spine and to bring us in. And I think that's a good, it's a good practice to, to balance out your class the way we do with, with counter poses. You know, if you do very lots of back bends, you might want to do some front bends and twists and so on. But if you do a lot of work in the lower body, you may want to take that work up and out through your shoulders, arm, neck, and head. And vice versa, if you do some strong work in the, in the upper body, you may just want to make sure that the legs are involved at the end or, or prepare your class that way. So let's start, let's just start, just for a moment, let's just start on the ground. And just drop your arms quite wide, feet on the floor. So like me, if you've been practicing for a while, you, you have your habits, which are good also because it's over time stuff that you've learned. But I recommend that you don't tidy yourself up and string yourself out and make it all tense and perfect right away because then you can't actually hear you can't actually listen in to what you're bringing today and you're putting yourself in the mode of correcting and fixing. Whereas in the long term, walking with is the most beneficial I have found. It's like with a friend, you know, we can, we can walk with a friend through a lifetime and we can grow, but if we rush in and fix things because we're upset that they're upset, that doesn't lead anywhere, doesn't bode well. And it's the same, although in a class, a teacher may come by and with touch Together, you may realize, wow, when I go too much in that direction, maybe that's not helping me. And so corrections of that nature can be wonderful and surprising. Surprising, but there is never a rule. We're all very different, even though there is a biological base to how we move. So here we are, just lying on our backs. And um, just let your forearms through your fingers, through your fingers, let your forearms come out. Let them roll around on your elbows and plonk. And notice as you come near, as you open up to nearness, as you let yourself become a vessel full of delicious new wine, so you feel your weightedness, as you come near and you feel your weightedness and you're aware of where the breathing is, how it's moving today in relation to work or to something that happened. Yeah, aware of the flow and the undulation of the breath, not making yourself breathe in some correct place. For example, the belly, it's just not helpful that in yoga, we have to learn to breathe with the belly. No, you may be someone who has to learn to stop breathing in their belly. Normal breathing, everyday breathing is just a two-way movement of the belly aspect. So the diaphragmatic aspect of the breath, let's say, and the chest, so the costal aspect of the breath, the movement of your ribs. And in fact, when things are ordinary, more or less, they move together. As we go towards digestion and sleep, 
we start to have more belly breathing, which takes us into a parasympathetic, so a towards sleep and coziness place. The belly begins to rumble because we're safe. And so the stomach has permission to pour its gastric juices through the pyloric valve into the duodenum. And we hear that rumbling. It doesn't mean necessarily that you're hungry, but it does mean that you feel safe. So in yoga classes and meditation classes, we often hear that rumbling, rumbling. But if you're having coffee with a friend and you're just happy, again, you may hear the rumbling. So belly breathing, afternoon, after a meal, night time, we start to decelerate and in a way kind of depress the system as it curls up and goes to sleep. Your alarm goes off, you delay, you snooze, then you wake up, then you realize that you're late for an appointment or work. And so then you start to activate and your chest begins to take off. And that animates the body because the movement of the ribs are very close to the nodes of the charge discharge system of your body, the autonomic nervous system on the front of the spine. And so we begin to be excited, excited, which helps us get to work on time. And so that's the chest breathing. And then we run for the bus, so we chest breathe even more, and it's wonderful. So our day should be able to have lots of excitement and lots of calming down, lots of excitement and love. And when we're happy and healthy, our system doesn't get stuck. You can get furious, and then you can become peaceful. And then you can work really hard and make the project happen. And, you know, and so we're doing this all day long. And then you can be digesting. And then you can get excited. It's someone's birthday. Up and down. It's like the ground and the sky. You know, we have a tendency to say that being grounded is a good thing. You know, we should all be grounded and we should look grounded. And in yoga, we're always grounding. But that's only half of our movement in gravity. The other half is lifting and opening to the sky. Lifting and opening to the sky. And we need both, you know. Too much grounding and we're depressed. Too much lifting and opening, then we're hysterical. And we need this balance. So in yoga, you're always finding acceleration, deceleration, finding the ground, finding the sky, no body. So we bend up the forearms again, and this time we take the whole arm up, take the whole arm up, and we let the arms move around, noticing how the shoulder blades move, noticing how the ribs move or don't. I have this bit in the middle of my rib cage, which you know, it just, it just doesn't know how to, it doesn't know what to do. And I feel it very often when I'm on the ground, lifting the arms so much that the shoulder blades come off, putting the shoulder blades back on the floor, letting the arms fall. Okay, let's, Lift the head a little, tuck your chin in and lift the head. So we're making a deep flexion of the cervical spine and then plump the head back on the floor. Lift, tuck the chin in. You can even gently, don't squeeze, but you can kind of lift your head. Lift, leave your feet on the floor. Yeah, come up a bit more, really let the chin fall in. This, in, in Sanskrit, this would be a bandha. We're closing one of the horizontal parts of the body, one of the diaphragmatic, let's say, areas here. This is the aperture of the thoracic cage, the upper aperture or the, um, where the top of the lungs meet this area here. And let go again. 
Now let's lift the head the other way. Let your chin come up. So your chin is going up and you're letting the back of the head drop back and lift. Don't, don't do anything that's hor feels horrible, but we are retroflexing the neck or extending the neck. And then put the head back down. Okay, we're going to lift and plump the head on the floor quite hard. Just let it fall, I think. Let it fall. Don't worry about your head. Lift and plunk it down. You should hear a nice thud. Lift and plunk. Okay, see if you can lift your head without tucking in too much or tucking back too much. So what you need to do, watch my hands, is open your eyes and project your face this way. You see my voice doesn't change at all. So what I'm doing is I'm stimulating the muscles on the front of the neck, especially the longus collie, which is a beautiful muscle. Looks like basket weaving and it stabilizes the neck. It's a little bit like the psoas on, from, from lumbers to pelvis to leg, kind of stabilizing their flexion extension. Here the head comes up and this structure causes me to not have to go this way or this way, but to be in the middle. And then put your arms out like this. And we're just gonna stay here for about 55 minutes. So just smile, turn your head to the right, turn your head to the left, say your favorite poem to yourself or to the person you're practicing with, and then put the head back on the ground. <sighs> and drop the arms. Just stay where you are, plant your feet, lovely big reaching toes, heels, balls of the feet. And then we're gonna just let the tail take us up and you're going to roll. It may shunt your spine up a bit, but don't worry, just keep rolling up. Don't lose your feet. I was losing my right foot, big toes. Knees not going towards each other or away from each other. And up you go that way, up that way, keep going, keep reaching down with the feet, reaching out with the knees, letting the spine go with you. You see, never are we essentially shaping the body. We're not, the body shapes itself over time. We are orienting the body. And this is really, in my feeling, this is what yoga really is. The gymnastics and sport and calisthenics and bodybuilding, it's all wonderful. But yoga is, a, is an art where we bring nuance to all these things because we're orienting the body. And that's what Banda used to say. You know, you're not stretching, you're not forcing, you're grounding and lengthening on the wave of the breath. She said the great revolution in understanding what we're doing is when we discover that the spine is making a two-way movement, ground and space, space and ground. And this two-way movement is an extraordinary separation of the spine. And then the whole body starts to become happy Feel itself. So off we go again, tail, huge feet. We're orienting our tail. So the imagery is to help us orient and to take us away from the shape. Yeah. So even in yoga, the names of the animals, they, they give us an orientation. You know, they give us a direction. Tail fly. Going to let the arms come up. And we're going to roll way up onto those upper ribs, upper ribs, huge upper spine, big feet, really rest on the upper spine, move, moving the arms, staying with the ground where you're on the ground and opening to the space and giving the body direction. Yeah, and then coming back down in reverse. So it's like you're hanging from your tail 
coming down, coming down, coming down through the spine, big feet, lots of space. Letting go, letting go. Big feet, one more time. Tail, let it accelerate. This time bring your arms way up over your head. Keep going up. Release the head into the floor, the shoulder blades, big feet. Way, 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 way up. Lots of length along the inside of the legs, the outside of the legs. Breath and releasing back down. Now the secret of this, of all the Setubanda variations, this one with the arms above the head is the deepest and most challenging to the upper spine, but also most beneficial because it gets the two upper ribs, number one and number two moving, where most of us have serious traffic jam. So as you come down, Try to get very quiet and just let your body figure out what's going on. If you have to widen your arms or put something under your arms, you're welcome to. But don't, don't fidget and get out of the position. Stay there. One more time. Way up. Way up. Way up. So if you sound, uh, 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 you can hear if you're squeezing or holding on somewhere because the resonance will be gone. And then as you come down, down through those upper ribs, sounding, you may literally feel the bones. The bones, the bones are vibratory bones. You may literally feel your bones vibrating all the way down, all the way down to the tail and then just let go, let go, let go, let go, let go, let go. Letting the breath through, remembering you're a big bag of water. So resonating, you don't need to worry about what you just did. You don't need to wonder if you did it right. It doesn't, it doesn't work like that. Then we're just gonna let the legs go both to the left or to the right. And then let's just fold the legs in. Yeah, so there's so many ways of doing this. You can rest your elbows on the floor and let your legs be a little bit wide. This allows very often for the lower back to release and the sacrum to drop to the floor. Of course, this all has to do with how much your hips bend and your knees bend, and how long your arms are. And then you can put your hands around your kneecaps and very gently pull in. So you roll the pressure onto your lower back and then release. As the knees come up, the tailbone drops to the floor and then you 
You roll the lower back back down. And of course you can hook your ankles and you can also, you can also come connect your hands around your knees if that works for you or connect your hands behind your knees. And sometimes we, of course, a little bit of work has to happen with the hand. You can use a belt, but sometimes if you get quiet, I'm gonna, I'm gonna lock my fingers because my hands are so, if you get quiet, you really discover how you're dropping onto the front of the back. It's like, it's as if your pelvis is letting go to the floor with your tailbone, but your legs, your quadriceps, your thigh muscles feel like they're bending forward with every breath, flexing more and more and kind of articulating themselves away from your pelvis. So it's like your pelvis is falling to the floor and your thighs, your legs are no longer so, so strongly pulling on the pelvis as they continue to release into this front bend, this flexion. And something starts to get quiet and long all along the front of your back. So that would be almost imagine behind the visceral river. If the front of your spine was the riverbed and the visceral river, so the tubes going down your throat and your lungs and your stomach and the liver and all of the fermenting tract, all of that, the kidneys, all the visceral tissue. Imagine that was all the mud and life and seaweed and stuff that's on the riverbed. Yeah, so you're, what happens is the activity of your legs is constantly reacting, making the riverbed react. The, front of the back react and it's bending it and pulling it and pushing it. We looked at that a little bit last week. Okay. Feet. So just coming round, having a moment on your side. Oh, wonderful. So wonderful. So just have a moment. Just walk around the room and reorient. Just have a moment to let your body balance itself out.
Okay. So we're going to look at we're going to look at standing again and the, and the standing poses. Let's just let's just take a moment to just be somewhere on your mat or not on your mat or half on your mat. And just sense sense down and sense up. I know that there is a there's something there's a very old injury which is happy these days on on my left side and so there's something asymmetrical and if I'm brushing then it's just uncomfortable and I try to iron it all out but it doesn't it doesn't work like that because it makes me fidgety actually so it's better I I find do what works for you I rock then I acknowledge that this leg feels different and the heel feels higher. It isn't, but it feels higher. So it feels like I'm, I've got a heel under that. So I rock and I, I open up to that. I don't need to correct it, open up to that. We can swivel. You know, the world is, there's time. The world is deep. So, so when I'm practicing when, with the yoga or the meditation or gardening, you know, I remember, I remember that I'm not a flat two-dimensional screen thing with a problem. I remember, which is one of the great gifts and realities of our embodiment, that we remember, we remember how deep, how much space even if there is an acute pain or something is off, we remember that we can work with it. And uh, it helps us move away from the self-judging and rejecting, which then we pass on to others. So that's why if you do very athletic yoga and fast, it's fun, but you have to remember that the tendency is gonna take you towards that performative boxing fixing accomplishing of an action thing and uh, it has its own um, consequences okay okay now i'm just going to let the fingers of my right arm take my arm up i feel my feet i feel my back and my front yeah and then I notice that there is a moment where the arm will, will start, the shoulder blade will rise, the clavicle will rise, and it will, it will start to take my chest. So arm goes up and then the arm starts to take those ribs with it. And I kind of enjoy each rib, let's say, hanging off each rib if my head wants to go over but i'm not bending i'm i'm actually arching here and i'm on my feet and something is short by my thumb so i open it up and i'm rooting down and i'm opening up and i open my eyes if i want to be outside of it and then i just drop the arm and just notice the difference through that if I make a bend, I'm not going to open all that up. I'm doing something else over here. So now my fingers of my left arm go up. And as they go up, I stay on my axis and on my feet. And, you know, this can be independent at first. Toes, heels, foot, hand, pathways, pathways. Yeah. So an action is a river of perception. And perception is an action. They're not separate things. They go completely together, whether you can language it or not, or you can write about it or not, or it doesn't matter. Now my arm is starting to take my shoulder blade at the back and my clavicle is lifting. And this incredible fold that happens here where the biceps goes under 
let's say, into the shoulder space, yeah. under the acromion. And then now I'm starting to feel that, or imagine that each rib is hanging off the lower one, lower one, and I'm going down. Let my head go and see what that feels like. Or I can orient my head like my hand. I could swivel a bit just to change those pathways. I could dive inside or open up to the world around me. Opening, I can feel the palm opening. Yeah. Yeah. I have a tendency to arch in my lower upper back. You may be very different. You may be more here. So then just put my hand here so that I can go in my tendency or I can have a slightly different quality with the chest. And then I let it drop. That's good. And just let yourself resonate with what's moving. Yeah. Wonderful. So the fingers take all the arms up. 75 fingers taking 52 arms up. Okay. And now we're gonna, we're just going to let the arms take us into a, this is like a gondola, which is up on one end. So it's like that way. And then my arms take me more towards a, a long bow that is standing on one end, bowing, my, it's my fingers taking me, but I'm bowing from my heels all the way through. Okay. So <clears throat> you're just standing on your own two feet and you just take a step forward. So the first stepping variation in yoga after standing, after mountain pose, are the triangle poses. And the triangle poses have straight or bent knee variations and turning one way or the other variations. And of course, the size of step is part of the variations. But there is a moment eventually where you start to have to be on the front foot and then you're in another group of poses, more the warrior and the moon poses. So we're going to stay on this back foot and we're just going to take a step like that. We can go forward and back and then rest. When I'm happy, rest over that back leg. And this returning is a wonderful way of feeling it because if you've never felt, if you're kind of going, I don't know what he means, where, how do I know? Just keep you swing to the front foot and then swing back and feel that you're really on that back foot. Yeah. And then we're pointing forward. Your feet don't need to be parallel. One day they might get parallel, but I think if you start like that with an idea that it has to be, you get in the way of this back hip. So I just wouldn't be like this because then that's a different kind of thing. <laughs> We're walking, you know, we're going forward and we've taken a step and we've stopped there. So this could, could, foot could be slightly turned out. And I'm on this back heel and I'm letting this drop away and I'm finding my heel and I, I have my upness as well. And some of our backs are more curved, some of our backs are more flat, some of us are more in flexion or extension. So all of these are beautiful variations of color that we each have. And the more you get to know your pattern, then the more you can play with where you are. Okay, I'm gonna put my hands on my hips right here. So I can see that my hips are pointing forward, okay? So from my feet to my hips, let's say to my belly button, the lower triangle of my body, the lower triangle of my body, my base is like that and it's pointing that way. Then from my belly button to the upper triangle, which is my elbows, 
I could turn towards my back foot without turning the lower triangle. So I let all of that there. And the spine knows how to do this. This, this action of up and down develops early in a little baby. It's the beginning of developing the breathing motion of a central tendon and a diaphragm so that we can breathe. So we actually know how to make this movement, but we've forgotten because of all the different ways that we are. So we've forgotten how to make this separation. So in triangle pose, we're remembering, this is my base, and then from my belly button down to my heels, let's say big toes. And then from my belly button to my elbows, I'm lifting. That's why in triangle pose, we lift the arms in a way. It helps us to feel the lift that I'm rooting and leafing. I'm rooting and leafing. This is really in the secret teachings of yoga is called carrot asana. Carrot asana. Orange for the root, green for the leaves. Those are the secret sacred colors. If anyone ever tells you that, they have revealed to you the entire mystery of yoga and you will disappear in a puff of air. So you probably all disappeared now, so I'm really sorry about that. Roots, lifting, lifting, and then let your arms make an inverted triangle that way. So rooting and lifting. And then because your feet are going that way, you can turn your upper body a little more and look behind you and let your arms come down. And you're leafing, you're not becoming a rigid, thing you're leafing you're growing out through your fingers and you're rotating your neck and you're going down into your arms maybe you make a uh, sound uh, and then drop the arms drop the arms if i if i leave my feet and i go the other way i'm doing reverse triangle pose now, the reverse triangle pose is actually the way we walk as adults. We have a counter rotation of leg and arm when we're walking. So just let your arms take you into this counter rotation. It's very satisfying and very deep. You probably see my shirt turning against itself at the middle. Huge heels, stay on that back foot big feet don't look at the shape just play with it play with it you can also put your hands on your head and let the elbows take you around 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 and release and come back actually take a couple of steps and just feel yeah, the swing, yeah, the swing, swing of arm and leg, or make the arms and legs swing. Just feeling, feeling that you can look down, but you can look up, you can look back and out. Yeah. Okay. So we could step forward like we did it. But you can also step back so you can be more on the front of your mat. Uh, so what did I do? I stepped forward with my left leg. So I'm going to step back with my left leg. I'm going to step back. That was stupid. I'm going to step back. Back with my left leg onto the left heel, letting that just hang off. Heels down, yeah. looking forward, solid base from the belly button down. And then just letting the elbows come up and letting yourself turn towards that back leg. As you turn, feel how the feet can root and root and root. Let your elbows reach out, let your breastbone come up, very open, up into the throat, up into the throat, open down through the back of the legs, 
Yeah, and open the arms. Stay on that huge back heel. And as you rest on it, wobbling and oscillating, rocking, breathing. Yeah, you're in the movement. You're not worrying about the shape at all. Just, I can feel my pelvis on this side wants to turn. So just in terms of that, I reorient my pelvis to look forward. That's all. And I'm lifting. And I can go the other way. Go the other way. Open across. 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 Beautiful. So, yeah. So through the work of Vanda Scaravelli, eventually it was, it became apparent to lots of people that you didn't always have to be palm down. Because when you pronate your forearm like that, you actually are pulling the whole system down and you are, you're doing that with your body, which is great. So if we do that, you know, palms down, rotating in, pulling down, it's an out breath on the ground kind of movement. So I can do it this way. But if I turn the arms and I soften the elbows, I start to open this up. So I get a different quality. So play with that. You can be more here, but you can also be more here. And then sometimes if you bend the elbow, you get another feeling of going out through the elbows. So none of these should become rules or fads. It's just that suddenly we gave ourselves permission not to do it only as it was in the photo of the book by Iyengar, like that with a much bigger step. We started to play with all of these possibilities. We can be way up here, way down there. Yeah. Open. <sighs> or hands on the head and release. So <clears throat> if you take one of your arms and just let it rest on the shelf of your bum, Some peoples have bigger shelves than others, bum shelves. So just let it, so I'm just letting my arm rest there and I'm letting my shoulder rest there. Then I'm going to slowly just play with this movement. So the important thing is not to hoik, if you hoik your shoulder up, you actually limit your movement, okay? And also, if you back bend, you limit your movement. But if you stay as soft as you can here, and actually, if you let your shoulder not do this, but you let it sink forward, you will discover counterintuitive as it may seem that you can go further. See, if I do like this, I'm kind of stuck. I have to kind of wedge against myself. But if I let go here, then I have this room because the shoulder joint have, is okay. It's okay. It's not being forced open. Then I can start to wiggle up. And this is kind of delicious. If there's no pain in the shoulder, wiggle away and effort away. And then you can go over and hook and hook away. If you can't hook, you can do all other things, like you can have a bit of a yoga mat. And then a bit of a yoga mat or something that goes over and connect and walk up. Okay, so we're just going to hook. Well, I'll just stay for that. Okay. 
And then you're on your feet. Bring your upper arm close to your head, like you want to put it behind your head. But you see how my tendency is to lift my ribs. So I'm not going to go against that. But once I'm there and I'm comfortable, I'm just going to let go in my ribs. And then I'm just going to curve forward. Bend my knees and curve forward. And quite quickly, you'll discover you may have a bit more give. Huge feet, just folding over yourself. We've done this often in the past months, also lying down, rolling around on it, but we're just gonna do a more traditional version of this, which is done in standing or kneeling. Okay, and then back and then let go. And I just shake it up. The breath. So very often we do these shoulder or arm movements and we're thinking about the shoulder and the shoulder blade and the humerus and the deltoid. But it's not really only that. There is an incredible intelligent surface of skin and adipose tissue or fat with fibers or fascia in it, and then layers under that. So it's not just sticks and bones. And then this stuff is sitting on something. Well, what does the shoulder sit on? It sits on the ribs, but it's not separate from the ribs. They work together. They work together. In fact, the shoulder at the back is not joined to the spine. It's called a functional joint. So it's tissue that is connecting the shoulder blades back there. So they sit on this rib cage, which is very domey like this. And that sits on this visceral space, this space of lung and heart and diaphragm and veins. And so, you know, moving this is really moving a whole concert, a whole concert of things. So when we do the other side, Try to imagine that inside you get support all the way up into your armpit, or down into your elbow to make, to make the movement. You're not just fighting with your shoulder. I can't remember. Yeah, this one. So that's resting. That's resting on the shelf of your bum. This is being allowed to just be soft. Then you get your arm to go up. You can use your other arm if you want to play it like this and sort of pull it up. Yeah, like that. Yeah. Letting this stay soft and curved. Then the other arm goes up. We did this at the beginning of the session. So rooting down into the feet and just letting this open as I drop over. And I look for my fingertips, or I use my belt or my yoga mat, and I connect. Yeah, so a moment of effort is fine, and a moment of connecting, it's great at this moment. So this is a mudra, the Sanskrit for when a gesture closes like this against itself. So the body closes a circle. The minute I have the mudra, whether I use a belt or my fingers, I have much more information about what's going on right here. Yeah, and then here we go. I'm just gonna let my knees bend. <sighs> Fold myself over. Let your shoulder fall forward, the shoulder of the down arm. Coming back up and just letting it open. And wonderful. Okay.
Okay. Let's see what time it is. Okay, so we're going to let both arms rest on the shelf of your bum. You're on your feet. And again, we're going this way with the arms, but you don't need to do that right away. You don't need to rush into the image of the shape. Just let one arm go up a bit, let the other arm go up a bit, you know, play with that wiggle. It's a bit earthwormy, fold, release. Breathe, let your inner rib cage and shoulder follow you, follow you, and then tuck your arms. If the hands don't meet, you can just leave them like that. And it doesn't matter if you're down here, that's great. You just, whatever your, whatever your limit, you know, whatever works for you. little wiggles then the hands meet maybe and then you let the hands come together and then slowly as the hands come together this is a work of letting the palms reach for each other and you want to let the clavicles move away from each other but you don't need to rush into a back bend just wait for the front of the body to open Lots of breath, front of the body opening. And again, we can fall forward a bit. And this time we can lift and fall back. Imagine that there is lots of olive oil where your clavicle meets your breastbone or sternum. It's a very wonderful, sophisticated joint with lots of ranges of motion, lots of up and down and rotating and back and forth. And release. Okay, so this is how we're gonna close and then you're welcome to continue on the floor. <clears throat> we looked at this a couple of weeks ago. Um, going to be um, maybe maybe start about two feet from the wall or two and a half feet from the wall. We'll see. We're going to let the knees bend. That will open the feet. Heels going back. So we're ungrasping the feet. We're letting the tail stick out. We're letting the torso curve a little bit. We're gonna let the arms go up. And then as I come up through my legs, I bring my arms together and it's as if two friends are lifting me by the hand up and out of whatever I'm in here, up and out of gravity. So they lift me up and out and my, I start to do a back bend which travels up my spine, if you can see my thumb. So I'm going up here, I'm not just making a bend down here, I'm making a huge back bend way up in the spine. My arms come together, my elbows come towards each other and I let my pelvis eventually go forward as I keep lifting up and rooting through my heels I lift up even more and I'm opening the front of my spine the riverbed where, where the bed of the river runs behind the visceral mm, intelligent mud of the body and I'm doing back bend if I do here it's okay Okay, so I have my wall, I'm a little bit away. <coughs> and I don't think about it, I just bend my knees and I go up and I'm rooting through my feet and I'm lifting through my arms 
and I'm going forward with my pelvis and it's my upper spine that needs to bend. And I touch the wall. And I'm bending high up in the spine. So maybe we'll do that one more time. Take a little step forward or back if that was too far. Yeah, no performance. It's just, you're just finding out. So we're gonna drop the legs, let the feet unclench, huge heels, and then we fly up, lifting up through the arms, rooting the heels, I like to move my feet there, so that you're really high up in the back bend, high up, and then the pelvis goes forward, and that's how we go back. High. Letting the arm drop out of the armpit. Great. Okay. And then you might want to do a little fold forward, a little fold forward, soft forward. Widen the legs if you need to. And you may want to stay longer in one or the other. So it's really up to you. We're closing the class. But the other very good thing to do after you've done a very strong back bend or front bend is to just let yourself twist. Yeah. So do what you need to do or do more back bends if you want to practice a little bit longer, it's all up to you. And then let yourself do a bit of a counter pose, soft front bend and a bit of a twist. And then being still for maybe another five minutes or so. Okay, so thank you everyone. And um, in case you haven't noticed, I just want to encourage you, I don't know if I ever mentioned this before, but there is a link on the yoga class invitation if, if you're getting it through my mailing list, if you're getting it through um, the meditation community, you can find it on the website. I did a, an interview on... Um, on our relationship to our embodiment and to uh, coming to wholeness and healing, but also in relation to events that have overwhelmed us, what we sometimes call trauma. And um, I looked at it and I, I actually think it's not bad and I think it's helpful. So if you haven't looked at it and this has been an issue for you and, and very often we find that yoga is helping us integrate these very strong events in our lives that have overwhelmed us, whether it's a car accident or someone's death or what have you. Have a look, have a look. So lots of love and see you next week. Enjoy your practice.